Hello and a very warm welcome to a brand new edition of World Panorama with me, Frank Pereira on Rajya Sabha Television. Over the next half an hour, we'll bring you a roundup of all the significant events that have taken place around the world this week. But first, a look at the headlines. More than 50 years of US-Cuba Cold War estrangement moves towards a thaw as their embassies reopen in each other's capitals, but deep-rooted issues between the two means normalization still has an uncertain future. Iran nuclear deal struggling to come to life, defending the landmark pact in the US Congress is an uphill task even as the President Obama and his men look to convince the Allies. Disturbing signals of the Islamic State expanding its footprint into Turkey, a massive explosion in a town along the Turkish-Syrian border kills more than 30. The attack is seen as another warning to Western nations fighting the Islamic State. And Greek Parliament passes final round of austerity measures. Talks on an 86 billion euro bailout underway in Athens. Experts see that nation slipping further into deep recession. Our top focus on the bulletin this week. The United States and Cuba formally resumed diplomatic relations this week after more than half a century of Cold War estrangement. It's a historical milestone in the thaw that President Barack Obama set in motion last year and the culmination of months of negotiations. But the promise of restoring full ties remains distant yet. Here's more. Fifty-four years after it was pulled down, that same Cuban flag flies again over that same three-story brick and stone building in Washington, D.C., a stone's throw from the White House. The Cuban foreign minister presided over the ceremony. Ties abruptly severed take off again officially. From the Cuban-American community, a historic moment symbolizing resurgent hope. We are Cuban-Americans and we've lived in this country for 54 years. So we saw and lived the change. So it's important to bring my children because that's part of their heritage, that's part of their history. And this is history in the making. They have a lot of things to deal with, but this is the first step. In Havana too, the reopening of the U.S. Embassy on the Malacan waterfront brought hope among many Cubans that the country is changing, albeit slowly. The U.S. flag will be hoisted here only next month, though work to grant visas and more is underway. Serious differences remain between the United States and communist-ruled Cuba. Efforts toward full normalization of ties are expected to proceed slowly. But the ceremonies carried enormous symbolism between governments that had long shunned each other. Of course, this milestone does not signify an end to differences that still separate our governments. But it does reflect the, the reality that the Cold War ended long ago and that the interests of both countries are better served by engagement than by estrangement and that we have begun a process of full normalization that is sure to take time but will also benefit the people in both Cuba and the United States. The differences, the rift, runs deep. Undoing five decades of the Cold War will not be easy. Go back 56 years to Fidel Castro's rebels taking power as dictator Fulgencio Batista flees Cuba. A year later, Cuba nationalized US-owned oil refineries. Most American businesses were appropriated soon afterwards. The US declared an embargo on most exports to Cuba in October. Three months on, the US snaps diplomatic ties with Cuba. Castro declares Cuba a socialist state. Between 1996 and 1998, hostile relations with many Florida-based migrants led to repeated confrontations. Cuban jets shot down two American planes. The US arrested five Cuban spies. Links were at their neither. Hope arose last year when President Barack Obama and Raul Castro announced restoration of diplomatic ties. Earlier this year, the U.S. formally removed Cuba from its terrorism blacklist. But there is some way to go. Riddled with potholes and bottlenecks all the way. Trade to Guantanamo to full normalcy calls for paradigm shifts. 
Solo la eliminación del bloqueo económico, comercial y financiero que tanto daño y privaciones ocasiona a nuestro pueblo, la devolución del territorio ocupado en Guantánamo y el respeto a la soberanía de Cuba darán sentido al hecho histórico que estamos viviendo hoy. Diplomatic ties restored, but will the trade embargo which has crippled Cuba's economy be lifted? And if so, when will the Cuban government improve its human rights record and incorporate outsiders into the political spectrum? How much and how fast will the lives of ordinary Cubans who earn $20 a month on average improve? Big questions. At least they are being asked now. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, joining me for a chat uh, on this particular subject is uh, former diplomat uh, Nirupam Sen. Ambassador, thank you for joining us on the program. You know, more than 50 years uh, of uh, US-Cuba uh, Cold War estrangement has finally led or moved towards a thaw. That's certainly a move in the right direction, isn't it? Absolutely. <coughs> it should, you know, this is, some, this is a move one should, uh, you know, recognize, which has been done by the United States. Hmm. Because Che Guevara, as early as 1961, uh, proposed to one of the aides of Kennedy, a modus vivendi and diplomatic relations, normal relations between Cuba and the United States. So actually it has taken the United States uh, more than 50 years hmm. to recognize this. Indeed, you know, the opening of embassies in both the countries' capitals yeah. is just a start, but there's a lot more work to be done because there are several contentious issues between the two countries. One of them, of course, is the trade embargo. Then, of course, uh, travel restrictions is another issue. Guantanamo is uh, another major problem as well. Now, do you see any hurdles coming up along the way? Well, there would be... You see, the main hurdle hmm. is, is that, you know, that the kind of changes that the USA would want in Cuba, I don't think uh, those changes are going to happen. Hmm. At any rate, not in the time frame that the United States has in mind. So that's eventually going to lead to some problems then? That is going to lead to some problems. Hmm. Because, you know, don't forget that the embargo, why has the, why, why, why has the United States decided to restore diplomatic relations? Because the US policy failed. It failed in terms of the kind of Polity they wanted in Cuba, they failed to impose that polity. It failed in terms of completely crippling the Cuban economy. Hmm. It failed in terms of the enormous uh, progress that Cuba made, and in fact uh, became really a world power in terms of education, medical research, health. It failed most signally of all in Africa, because th there, 10,000 Cuban soldiers changed the course of African history. Hmm. And without them, apartheid would not have crashed. Indeed. So therefore, you know, the U.S. has recognized this. Now, the U.S. already, there's talk that uh, there should be compensation for the properties that were expropriated. That is one. Hmm. Second, that there is already talk in the United States that Cuba must recognize Israel and have close relations with Israel and South Korea. But Cuba is much stronger than India in many ways. I don't, think, I don't think they would do this. Hmm. So therefore, I think hurdles will remain because the kind of economic and foreign policy concessions that the United States want, I don't see Cuba making those. You know, it's a deep-rooted prob deep problem, an underlying problem. There's that love, I, I, I wouldn't say love, but there is definitely a hate-hate relationship between the two countries. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, would there be that trust factor or mistrust factor going forward? No, I think uh, th there, is, there is going to be mistrust. Hmm. But there's, and the trust is only, you know, there, 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 there are concrete expectations which, are not, which have not been overtly stated on both the sides. <clears throat> on the Cuban side, it's very clear that in order for takeoff, the economics minister of Cuba has said that they require $2 billion yes. investments. So unless diplomatic relations were restored, these investments would not, would not move. Then again, there have been some, you know, there have been some kind of dilution of the embargo over the years, even from the side of the United States, because after all, you know, remittances from the Florida Cubans are going to Cuba. But these remittances are going to go up sharply to about $2 billion. Mm -hmm. So I think these are some of the expectations, the immediate expectations from Cuba. Because once you restore diplomatic relations, then automatically some of the aspects of the embargo 
get diluted automatically because then, for instance, the extraterritorial aspects of the embargo. I mean, USA would not take action against uh, Europeans or Canadians who invest mm. in Cuba. It would be much more difficult to do that. Yes. So, so, so these are the benefits that Cuba hopes for. Now, what the United States hopes for, quite obviously, is that through this, whether through intelligence, covert or other means, they would try to prize open Cuba. Indeed. And whether, whether that happens or not, uh, time would show. Indeed, time will tell us everything. Time is uh, a, a good factor in reveal th revealing things to us. But, you know, we've seen the U.S. this time around use a very different approach. Earlier mm. in the past, we've seen them enabling opposition groups in Cuba, but now they're engaging directly with the government and government officials. So is there a change in stand, do you see? And do you see this particular approach helping the ties to go to a new level? You see, uh, there are two things here. One is that there was always an opinion in the United States. Because don't forget, even as early as uh, about exactly 40 years ago, mm. that is on the 9th of July, uh, 1975, that an attempt was made by Kissinger. In fact, he even used the phrase that let us engage chivalrously and not as shysters. Mm. <clears throat> an attempt was made to establish diplomatic relations with Cuba. But the price that Kissinger demanded was that Cuban troops should withdraw from Africa, specifically Angola, which Castro refused to mm. do. So it didn't work out. So there has always been a view from that time onwards that perhaps engaging Cuba, uh, the Cuban government, establishing diplomatic ties is a better way than the crude weapon of the embargo to bring about the changes that the United States desires All right. in Cuba. So mm. this has been a view. That is one. Second thing, of course, is that, uh, you know, that uh, the United States has recognized mm. that uh, ultimately the thing that they feared the most, because, you know, when Che Guevara, as I mentioned, spoke to an aide to Kennedy, mm. the Kennedy administration was not interested because Arthur Schlesinger at that time, yes. you know, in the Kennedy White House, he said that we are going to visit on Cuba, all healths, mm, mm. all possible healths. Yes, yes. Now, they tried their best to visit all possible healths in Cuba. Mm, but failed. But, but failed completely. So, therefore, I think uh, they, have, they have also recognized that there is no other option because the main fear that Schlesinger, you know, mm. pinpointed mm. is that the Cuban example may spread. Indeed. And the Cuban example did spread, not just Nicaragua or the Sandinistas, mm. but the point is that Cuba is the bridge from the Soviet type of socialism yes. to 21st century socialism. And you have a host of Latin American countries represented in Alba, you know, Bolivia, yes. you know, Venezuela, most of all, uh, Uruguay, you know, Ecuador, and so on, who have embarked on this kind of 21st social, socialist path, El Salvador. Mm. So therefore, I think the Americans have recognized that the example in some way has come into this century. Indeed. And therefore, the best thing is to engage them and see whatever benefits we can get. Sure. All right. And that's the approach that the U.S. seemed to be taking at this yeah, point in time. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for joining Thank us you. on the program and putting things into perspective for us. Well, on that note, we'll slip into a short break now, but still to come. Houthi rebels carry out attacks against Saudi strongholds in Aden city of Yemen. Most of the dead are civilians who have borne the brunt of months of fighting in the country. That and much more after a short break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Rajya Sabha Television. Well, the landmark Iran nuclear deal reached earlier this month now looks for its next round of clearance. Though ratified by the United Nations efforts this week, many countries remain far from convinced. The U.S. continues efforts to sell it to many of its allies, even as the green signal by the U.S. Congress looks the most daunting challenge of all. Don't trust Iran, the single biggest rallying point in protests against the Iran nuclear deal. And many of them have broken out across the United States, most of them politically motivated. An underlying US public sentiment propped up by Republican senators and presidential candidates as the country heads into election mode feels the deal letting Iran off sanctions spells a rise of terror unlimited. If this deal goes through, 
Without exaggeration, the Obama administration will become the world's leading state sponsor and financier of radical Islamic terrorism. So the construct that Secretary Kerry has in his mind that there's a moderate uh, hardline element and we need to empower the moderates, I think is a gross misunderstanding of Iran. I think the American people are going to weigh in and Congress is going to reflect their opinion and that we're going to kill this bill. Under a bill reluctantly signed into law by President Obama in May, the U.S. Congress has till the 17th of September to decide. President Obama's promise to exercise his veto if Congress rejects the deal would require a two-thirds majority of both the House of Representatives and the Senate. So far, the challenge is uphill. Obama's men are pulling out all stops to sell the deal to Congress. The U.S., after laboriously negotiating this multilateral agreement with five other partners, were to walk away from those partners, we're on our own. Our partners will not walk away with us. Instead, they will walk away from the tough multilateral sanctions regime that they've helped to put in place. And we will have squandered the best chance we have to solve this problem through peaceful means. Beyond Congress at home, it extends to convincing the Allies and some big ones at that. Israel has voiced strong opposition to the deal even before it was signed. U.S. Defense Secretary Ash Carter and other senior U.S. officials traveled to Israel, Saudi Arabia and Amman on missions to convince. Iran has said it will not accept any extension of sanctions beyond 10 years. Detractors of the deal warn of worse ahead. מצוטט כאומר שצריך להתכונן להילחם בארצות הברית בלי קשר לשאלה אם יהיה הסכם. נסיעה של איראן רוחני עומד בראש מצעד סיני ברחובות טהרן, מצעד שבו שורפים דגלים של ארצות הברית וישראל ורבבות קוראים מוות לאמריקה, מוות לישראל. אבל זה לא כל כך נגטיב. The UN Security Council has endorsed the comprehensive agreement to lift economic sanctions on Iran in exchange for strong checks on the nuclear front. The IAEA has been requested to oversee implementation, so in that sense, things are on track, at least for now. It's fingers crossed for things actually being put in place. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha Television. Moving on, now a brutal terror strike at a Turkish border town this week raises fresh fears of an expanding Islamic State footprint beyond Syria and Iraq. It's seen as a reprisal for Turkey's actions against the militant group or, or as another brutal warning for foreign powers fighting the Islamic State menace. Turkey has decided to pull out all stops for security, including allowing the U.S. to use its territory for airstrikes. Here's a report. July 20th, Suruj on the Turkey-Syria border. Amateur video of a demonstration of youth support for an aid mission to war-torn Kobani in Syria. And in the middle of it, this. The gory aftermath, the ugly dance of death and mayhem, young lives brutalized by more of the terror machine that the world has now come to recognize. The death toll was 31, most of them university students, over 100 injured, scarred for life. Some 500 people have been detained in Turkey, people suspected of working with the IS in the last six months. Officials are concerned that the attack is part of an Islamic State campaign of retaliation for a recent crackdown on its operations in the country. And if they're right, Turkey would be a particularly vulnerable target. The country shares a 1,250-kilometer-long border with Iraq and Syria putting it nearby to strongholds of the self-proclaimed ISIL in both these nations. 
Turkey has boosted its border defenses, stationing tanks and anti-aircraft missiles along its frontier with Syria, as well as bolstering troop numbers. If confirmed, this would be the first such attack by the Islamic State against Turkey, a regional military power and NATO member. And as recent arrests show, the extremist group already has established its reach here. Terör tehdidine karşı özellikle Suruç saldırısı üzerinde de Türkiye ve Suriye halklarını birbirinden ayırmayacak, sadece teröristlerin giriş çıkışlarını engelleyecek, insani amaçlı geçişleri kolaylaştırabilecek, yabancı savaşçıları engelleyecek bir çalışma gereklidir. There's another dimension too, like the attack orchestrated in Tunisia a few weeks back. This one continues the theme of targeting foreigners, particularly Europeans. Istanbul attracts 7.5 million tourists every year. After 30 Britons were killed in Tunisia, the UK listed Turkey too as a specific potential target, describing the threat of terrorism there as high. The global community has frequently expressed concern and support. We express our solidarity with the Turkish government and the Turkish people and reaffirm our undeterred resolve to the fight against the shared threat of terrorism. Turkey has upgraded the IS threat to the biggest one it faces today, with alarm bells set ringing across the civilized world. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha Television. Well, let's now take a look at some newsmaking events that made headlines across the globe this week in our Globe Watch. Turkish fighter jets bombed Islamic State positions inside Syria and Iraq on Friday, marking a dramatic hardening of Turkey's stance towards the groups. Ankara had previously been criticized for not doing enough against the group. The strikes come in the backdrop of what's seen as a stepped-up Islamic State offensive in Turkey. There's also been a rise in border skirmishes between Turkish forces and Islamic State militants along Syria and Iraq's border with the country. Turkey also finally gave the green light for the US to use a key airbase in South for airstrikes against the Islamic states. Yemen was rocked by a spate of terror attacks this week. At least 57 civilians were killed on Sunday when Houthi rebels bombarded Aden, where Saudi-backed pro-government forces have made gains against the insurgents. At least 18 of the killed were civilians. A day later, a car blast outside a Houthi mosque in Sana'a killed five people. It was orchestrated by the IS wing in Yemen. Over 3,600 people, nearly a third of them civilians, have been killed in Yemen over months of unrest. The UN has expressed strong concern on the number of civilians killed. NASA says that its Kepler spacecraft has spotted Earth's bigger, older cousin, the first nearly Earth-sized planet to be found in the habitable zone of a star similar to our own. A newly discovered exoplanet, Kepler-452b at a distance of 14,000 light-years from Earth, comes the closest of any found so far to matching our Earth-Sun system. The planet has the right temperature within the habitable zone and circles a star very much like our own Sun. Discovery of this first official Earth-like planet is expected to fuel the drive to spot more habitable planets elsewhere in the galaxy. Well, Greece and its creditors are at the talking table at last for a fresh 86 billion euro bailout package after the Greek parliament passed the final set of austerity measures early on Thursday. 230 lawmakers in the 300-seat Greek parliament voted for the final batch of reforms, bringing it through parliament. This was a condition set by creditors for bailout talks to begin. But 36 out of 149 members from Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras's Syriza party voted against the overall bill or abstained. The measures got through with support from pro-euro parties. Interestingly, former finance minister Yanis Varoufakis, who had strongly opposed the reforms, voted for them this time. Meanwhile, Greece's banks reopened on Monday for the first time in three weeks, though strict limits on transactions continue. The Greek government met a Monday deadline to pay 4.2 billion euros to the European Central Bank and paid off some 2 billion euros in arrears to the International Monetary Fund. 
The money came from a short-term bridge loan that European Union officials arranged last week to cover the debts. Negotiators uh, from the European Central Bank, the European Commission and the Eurozone's bailout fund are in Athens for a first meeting with Greek officials on the bailout. Still, a final deal faces an array of challenges, including growing skepticism over whether the bailout plan can return Greece's ravaged economy to health. Well, shifting focus now, it's time to bring you up to speed with all the sports news that you might have missed this week. Here's our segment, Sports Action. World soccer governing body FIFA will vote for a new president at a special meeting that will be held next year on February 26, 2016 in Zurich. All the 209 member associations will decide on the successor to Sepp Blatter, who has been at the helm of FIFA since 1998. FIFA will also set up an 11-man task force to propose reforms aimed at cleaning itself up after a series of scandals. Luis Suarez scored a close-range goal on Wednesday as Barcelona claimed a 2-1 pre-season win over Major League Soccer side Los Angeles Galaxy in front of a record-packed crowd in California. The match also saw Suarez lined up against his former Liverpool teammate Steven Gerrard. Suarez had put the Catalan Giants ahead in the 45th minute before Sergi Roberto doubled the lead shortly after the break. Although MLS champions uh, Galaxy tried to pull one back through a Tommy Mayer header in injury time, Barcelona successfully fended off their opponents' late surge. India will host top seeds Czech Republic in a Davis Cup World Group Playoff Tennis Series to be played from September 18 to 20th at a venue yet to be decided. The winning nation will progress to the 2016 World Group while the losing outfit will be relegated to their respective Zone Group 1 events. The draw took place at the International Tennis Federation headquarters in London in the presence of its President Francesco Ricci. Czech Republic have won the Davis Cup thrice. India earned the right to participate in the playoffs after beating New Zealand at Christchurch. And finally, the intellectual thrills of the 2015 World Rubik's Championship in Sao Paulo in Brazil that united some of the world's meanest speed cubers. Take a look at the amazing dexterity and the brilliant minds battling it out. I'm Frank Pereira signing off. See you again next time.